now. I would be delighted to, to follow the entire lecture, but I have to fetch my daughter. <laughs> and uh, so, but we will keep in touch. Thank you and good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, very good. But then we start with the um, the course for today. And um, the first part will be on viscous flows, essentially. And um, so we, uh, we will have together during the next 30 hours, we will talk about two parts, viscous flow first, and then we will have a second part on stability and transition. And as I said, if there is any questions or anything unclear, then please just uh, interrupt me and I will try to uh, provide an, uh, an answer as, as much as I can. So today we will start with our first lecture, lecture number one, and we will talk about particular, particular uh, solutions um, to the Navier-Stokes um, equations. And uh, it is my understanding that during the last few weeks you have together with um, um, with Alessandro you have derived the Navier-Stokes equations and a number of other uh, governing equations, but you have not really looked at the uh, solutions yet. And that's exactly what we would like um, to do. Um, okay, there's a, there was a question about the exam. Um, I actually don't, whether the, the exam will be uh, written um, or uh, oral, actually, I do not know yet. Previously, during Corona, it was uh, oral. Um, but um, maybe we can go back to a written exam. I cannot say that yet. But I would say assume for the time being that it will be an oral exam. Okay. So um, let's start now with um, the simplest possible case that we can think of when it comes to um, calculating exact solutions to Navier-Stokes. And that actually, uh, the first example that we will look at is the example of so-called uh, Quet flow. That's what we're going to look at. And the reason for that really is this is the simplest case, apart from just having zero velocity everywhere. It's the simplest case of a shear flow. And the idea is we have a domain, which is, or we have a, a, a certain volume of uh, fluid, which is between two, straight walls. So we have this region here in the middle where uh, the fluid is located. So I can maybe write it like this. So there's there's fluid between uh, two walls. So this, this is one wall and this is another wall here. Now we need to give a little bit of, um, of uh, dimensions here. So we say that this height, so the distance between these two walls is um, capital H being two times small h. We can also introduce a coordinate system to make things uh, easier later on. So we have an x direction and we have a y direction um, like that. Now, of course, right now, nothing would happen because there is no um, velocities being induced. But now the, the interesting thing with Quet is, is that we actually say that the two walls, they are moving the two walls are moving in opposite directions. And we say that the two walls, they have speeds, which are uw and uw to the left and to the right on the, on the top and the bottom. And that of course means that the fluid, which is between those walls will also start to move um, due, to this, um, due to the viscosity in the flow, in, in the fluid and the movement of these two walls. So this is, this is actually quet flow. Before we, we start to calculate it, um, I would actually like to mention that there is a similar description of the same flow case where we can assume that we have one, oops, where we have one wall, which is actually at rest, and we have the other wall moving with a speed of two uw. So again, with a height of, um, h being uh, 2h, and here on the bottom we have u uh, being uh, zero. So that actually, if you again have a coordinate system, which we now could put the origin here at the, at the lower wall, x and y, this would correspond to exactly the same case as we will um, show, or as we will discuss later on. 
So this one here is now um, a quet flow. And uh, you can call this to be case one, and this I can be case two. Okay, so essentially we would like now to solve um, for this flow. Before we, before we do that, I would also like to give you a very quick um, background or a historical perspective on, um, on, on this flow or uh, the quad flow in general. And actually, it goes back to a... <coughs> to a French physicist um, who lived um, from 1858 um, to 1950, uh, 1943. And um, around 1870, Maurice Coet has performed experiments um, <clears throat> in flows configuration that kind of looked a little bit like, like these two plates that I'm, I'm just mentioned. And his idea was to develop um, viscosimeters. So essentially, he, he wanted to compute or, or measure uh, the viscosity of different fluids. And then the flow case that he came up with to do these measurements was exactly this. Um, what we call now uh, quad flow. Why is quad flow important for us? Well, it's actually a very simple model. As I was saying, it's kind of the simplest uh, flow case. It's a simple model for shear flows. Uh, so all the shear flows, if you just zoom in um, uh, sufficiently much, will essentially become a quad flow at, at some point. So therefore you can say, a quet flow is also relevant for, you know, astrophysical flows, for example, inside the sun at some point when you have, you know, different layers rotating at different speeds. At some point, it will all look like a kind of this canonical um, uh, shear flow. But still, even though it's very simple, as you can imagine here from these pictures, it still has a very, uh, a very rich behavior. A very rich behavior. Um, in particular, when you start to vary these velocities, this uw velocity, um, and I can I can say um, that this has a lot to do with um, stability and transition to turbulence. Um, for now, we just say it has a very rich behavior when the flow is going from laminar, from the laminar flow uh, to turbulent flow. So, from going from laminar to turbulent. Um, I will show you some examples, maybe not today, but um, next time on that. Yeah, and then as as um, Maurice Quet was um, kind of saying himself, it's not just that this is a, is a model; it actually has some some quite um, some practical applications um, applications uh, to, for instance, these um, viscosimeters that I was saying viscosity meters, um, but also in um, in cases of lubrication. So just think of an axle within a you know within a, a, a housing inside there. When you when you just want to make sure that you have, for instance, enough oil uh, for this lubrication to work. If you zoom in um, sufficiently much, it actually looks like a quet flow. Okay, so. Our purpose now is to solve um, or to find a solution to the Navier-Stokes equations within uh, these uh, geometry. So the question now is how to how to solve um, for the velocity profile. So how would you do that? Well, of course we have to start, so or, or we have to define our equations that we want to work with. And of course, these are the, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, um, as you have um, been deriving uh, during the last um, few weeks. Also here, I would just like to give you a very brief um, historical, per, um, uh, historical per, um, perspective on that. It was essentially um, three people, I would say, that, that have been working on developing uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. It starts, as with many things, uh, with Leonhard Euler. He was a Swiss mathematician living from 1707 until uh, 1783. And um, he did his um, main research when it comes to governing equations 
in the years, uh, you know, 15, uh, 1757 and, and some years afterwards, where, of course, he, he came up with the what we call now the Euler equations, which give the kind of the basic principles of um, conservation of momentum. But it was then, of course, the, 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 the Frenchman uh, Claude uh, Louis uh, Navier. And uh, he lived from 1785 until 1836. And he wrote down the Navier Stokes equations in 1822. And then it was George um, Gabriel Stokes. Um, who lived from 1819 to um, 1903, and he did his um, developments or rediscovered uh, essentially the, the, the Navier-Stokes, or what we call the Navier-Stokes equations nowadays, in 1842. Um, so essentially based on, on, the, on the work of, of these three people, we actually have now the full set of equations that we can use to uh, to solve fluid mechanics uh, problems. So we start now by just writing them down. It's um, two different um, two different equations. It's the continuity equation um, on the, the one hand. The continuity equation, as you all know, it's the time derivative of rho, rho being uh, the density, plus the, the divergence or the nabla operator applied on g times u, uh, g, uh, rho times u, which is um, zero. And here I just wanna uh, kind of mention my, my notation. Um, this one here, uh, that would be a vector. So um, I typically write an overbar to indicate that this is a, um, a vector. So u here would be the velocity vector. Okay, <clears throat> so this here would be um, the continuity equation written for a, for a general case. But if you now want to start with the simplest, um, the simplest physical description of a, um, of a fluid flow, you would actually like to, um, to go into a situation where the density of the flow can be uh, considered constant. So you want to go from the general description of just mass conservation into a description where, where the density is constant. So we can uh, do that very quickly. So we just have um, uh, d rho dt. And now I'm, I'm using the chain rule uh, to work a little bit with this, um, with this divergence term here. So we get u multiplied with the um, nabla times u, the gradient of rho, plus rho times the divergence of u. And this should, of course, still be, um, still be zero. And then we recognize that this part here, <clears throat> so the first two term actually corresponds to what we call the material uh, derivative. And then the second term remains the same. So this would be uh, the material derivative. Whereas this here was essentially mass conservation. <clears throat> okay, so now we have rewritten our continuity equation in this way, and now we can come in and say, okay, if we now want to look at what we call an incompressible flow, um, we essentially say that this material derivative, uh, this d rho dt, that is what we want to uh, set to zero. And that is really the definition of an incompressible flow in the sense that it says that uh, if you are a fluid particle and you follow um, your path along a fluid particle, your density is not supposed to change. That is exactly what is um, expressed by the fact that d rho dt uh, is zero. So the density, um, does not change um, along a fluid uh, 
um, trajectory. And of course, now if you go back to the equation, if you now say that d rho dt is, um, is zero, then of course that means as a consequence that also the second term needs to be zero, meaning that the divergence of u needs to be zero as well. And that is exactly what we would um, call the continuity equation for incompressible flow. So that's the continuity equation for incompressible flow. Um, I just want to make two comments here, which may be interesting uh, just to know. Um, so the first one is if the density is actually constant in the whole domain, then we will call the flow uh, to be homogeneous, um, incompressible. A simple flow. So that's uh, that's the that's the first comment. Uh, the, the second comment is um, kind of obvious, also, namely that uh, the 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 continuity equation that, as we've written here, so just the uh, nabla u is zero or the divergence of u is zero, does not imply that the density is constant. It just implies that the density along streamlines or a prop, uh, fluid uh, trajectories is actually uh, is constant. But it may be, you may have different densities in the flow. But again, if you don't want that, you would call and you would talk about a homogeneous incompressible flow. Okay, so this is the first equation that we, that we work with. And the second one obviously will be um, the momentum equations. Um, and that's, that's what people sometimes call the, the Navier-Stokes equations. But in the end, it's, it is simply um, the application of Newton's second law onto a fluid system. So we have the momentum um, equations, or the momentum conservation, I can maybe say, uh, I can write, that's probably better. Momentum conservation, like this. And the way that we can write it is rho times du dt, plus u times nabla u is the same as minus um, grad p plus mu times nabla squared u plus some force f. So this is the, the typical way that we would that we would write now in our Stokes. Now you can uh, change it a little bit in a more familiar um, formulation by uh, just dividing the whole equation by, by rho. So what we get is du dt plus u times nabla u is minus one over rho grad p plus nu times nabla squared u plus f. And this is kind of the way that we write it, um, usually write it when we start our, our analysis. And uh, I guess now it could be important to discuss a little bit what these, what the, what the different uh, terms mean. So the, the two terms on the, on the left-hand side, that is exactly the same material derivative that we were talking about uh, before. And that's really just the definition of this, um, uh, this derivative in capital D, uh, divided by capital DT of the velocity U. Then <clears throat> the first term on the, on the right-hand side would be the pressure gradient. Um, don't forget the row here if, we, if you have multiplied it on, the, on that side. Then we have the, uh, the viscous contribution. The viscous um, contribution, and um, as usual for a viscous uh, viscous term, it is a second derivative, so it's um, nabla squared of u. Uh, so there will be no viscous contribution if um, essentially uh, the second derivative is uh, is zero. And then we have here a forcing term, the f, and um, this is a volume force. <clears throat> 
Keep in mind that this is again divided by rho. So really what this equation um, expresses is nothing else than Newton's, Newton's second law in the sense that we have acceleration, which is the, 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 the material derivative, is the same as various types of forces. It could be the, the, the pressure force, it could be the viscous force or viscous stress um, and the, the volume forces. That's essentially what the, what the numbers those equation expresses. Okay, <clears throat> now, now we have talked about the, the actual equation. What are the variables um, that we are that we need to, to calculate? Well, we have the, the velocity u, which of course is a function of x, y, z, and time. So all our flow variables are defined in space and in time. And we have the pressure, which is only a scalar, but again, um, even that scalar is defined at all places in uh, space and time. So we were looking for a vector field of U and the pressure P defined in, in our um, whole domain. And now, if you look at this coupled system of the, the continuity equation and the, the Navier-Stokes equations, <clears throat> um, we can realize that this is actually a system of nonlinear, partial uh, differential equations. <clears throat> and um, uh, for which closed solutions, closed uh, solutions, so analytical solutions um, do in general do not exist. Do not exist um, except <clears throat> except for a few rare cases. And of course, these rare cases that uh, some of them we're going to discuss will be, for instance, quet flow. But there's also pipe flow, channel flow, where can actually uh, uh, where we can actually solve these uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And these exact solutions are typically very idealized, idealized cases, um, uh, we typically call these idealized cases also canonical cases. Canonical cases, um, which are not always fully relevant for an application. So for instance, we, we, we can solve quet flow um, but we cannot get an exact solution of the flow around an airfoil, um, for instance. So typically idealized cases, um, which, which are not always fully relevant for applications. Which of course also means that um, uh, if you now think of uh, what I said in the beginning, that um, we sometimes need computers or we need experiments to actually be able to, to get these solutions. That is still relevant even today because we simply have no other way of calculating these, these solutions. In addition, and that's what we see in, in the last part or the, the second part of this course, these exact solutions, these exact solutions to Navier-Stokes may not even exist, um, even, or they may not exist in, in, in reality, even though um, one can calculate them, because these solutions may actually be what is called unstable, maybe unstable um, for at least some parameters. And what I'm mainly talking about here is I'm, of course, uh, one of the, 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 the main um, determining numbers in fluid mechanics. Um, so that would be the Reynolds number. So typically, the Reynolds 
number. What, <clears throat> what this really means, um, we will of course uh, see more later on in this course, but uh, the basic idea is that uh, perhaps uh, an exact solution exists for low Reynolds numbers, but if you start to increase the Reynolds number at some point, the flow will kind of lose its stability, become turbulent, then of, and then of course the, the laminar solution does not uh, play any role anymore. Okay, so we're still kind of concerned with, um, with uh, finding our solution for quet flow. There's one last step that I would like to do, um, or two, two steps before, before we actually go back to, to trying to solve the equations. Um, I would like to show you yet another way of actually writing um, these equations. And um, this is actually due to, um, to Einstein. Um, so we rewrite the governing, governing equations um, using what is called the Einstein summation convention. Also here, I would uh, give you the, uh, the historical perhaps perspective. Um, of course, we all know who Einstein was, Albert Einstein, um, and he lived from 1879 to 1955. And uh, he came up with, um, or he introduced this, um, this notation into physics in 1916, um, where, where, where he started to use that for general relativity. Um, so 1916, he was putting, he was introducing that into the area of, um, of physics. And I guess you all know how, how the Einstein summation convention works. But with, with this, we can then write the continuity equation very simply as dy dxi being zero, which uh, essentially just means that we need to do a summation over the repeated indices, and the repeat is, repeated indices are then called so-called dummy indices. Just i would here be a dummy index. So the continuity equation, we have the momentum equation. And in the same way, um, dy dt plus u, uj dy dxj is minus one over rho dp dxi plus nu times d squared ui dx j dx j plus f i. So these are now uh, the governing equations that we have. So here the continuity equation and here the momentum equation. Just one last comment before we have um, um, a short break. Uh, here I wrote dx i dx j times dx j and and the way that i wrote this was in the uh, was in such a way that the the two indices j are really exposed that you could see these two indices j and uh, of course that makes them to be the dummy index of this term and we would need to repeat or do our some uh, summation over repeated indices over this uh, j here and that's my preferred way of writing it so i would perhaps suggest to you to not write this term as, as um, dxj squared. Because if you write it as a dxj squared, you would essentially lose the, you would not see these repeated indices and you would not immediately see that you would need to, re and that you would need to do a summation over these two terms. Okay, with this, um, I would actually like to close for the first hour for today. Um, I would like to stop the recording.